guys, so I want to come here and make another quick video. I happened to come across this um, information in a website um, ran by another um, Israelite sister of mine that I am a part of, and I had never actually heard of this before. Um, and so I wanted to, in doing research, I wanted to um, share this with you all. Perhaps you may have heard of it, and then perhaps someone may be watching it that haven't heard of it. <clears throat> So let's just get right into it. So um, this is talking about a fort down in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, and it was um, the first freed, first establishment for freed blacks um, to be legally sanctioned um, by the US, United States of America. Um, it's a couple of things about this is interesting outside of the fact that it was the first um, built and established settlement, settlement for freed blacks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the name is pretty interesting to me. Um, so it has a, a, a lot of uh, Spanish tie. Of course, you know there were a lot of Spanish um, people, or a lot. Of, the Spanish has a lot has a large presence in Florida today, even back then. Um, but the name sounds interesting. It's called Fort Moshe. I'm sorry, Mose. But to me, it sounds like Moshe, um, which would be the Hebrew um, or you know the Egyptian name for. Um, Moses. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm just going to read over this really quickly. I will leave the um, link in the description box to what this page that I'm on. Uh, but you know, it's, you can see it's a simple Wikipedia um, search and you can come across it. It's not a whole lot of information, but it's, it's some good stuff here nonetheless. Um, so it became a historic national historic landmark in October 1974. And it's down in St. Augustine, uh, Florida. And as you can see here in 1738, the Spanish government Governor of Florida, Man Manuel D. Montiano had Fort Mose, pronounced Mose rhymes with Jose, built and established as a free black settlement, the first to be legally sanctioned in what would become the territory of the United States. Um, the fort has also been known as Fort Musa or Fort Massa, variants of the Spanish pronunciation. So I'm going to keep scrolling down. Um, and here, the little, little short paragraph in historical background, I'm just going to read through it quickly. As early as 1687, the Spanish government had begun to offer asylum or refuge to slaves from British colonies. In 1693, the Spanish crown officially proclaimed that runaways would find freedom in Florida, get this, in return for converting to Catholicism in a term for men of four years military service to the crown. In effect, Spain created a maroon settlement in Florida as a frontline defense against English attacks from the North, Spain also intended to destabilize the plantation economy at the British colonies by creating a free black community to attract slaves seeking escape and refuge from British slavery. Now, I don't want to, you know, rain on the parade. I am ecstatic at the fact that this is, you know, was set and built as built for free blacks. But um, <clears throat> the one thing that kind of disturbs me about this is that it's, it's like, I don't want to say it's almost like, it is like they went from serving as slaves agriculturally to now serving as slaves on the front line because they were only guaranteed their freedom if they converted to Catholicism, which makes it interesting to make for me to think what were they before, um, maybe the typical standard modern day Christianity. Um, I'm not sure. So they had to, in order to get their freedom with the Spanish people in Florida, they would... Um, have to convert to Catholicism and then the men would have to serve four years of military service. Um, and you know, that trick is not something very new. Um, it also kind of reminds me of like, um, in America now for a lot of people that went to college to major, major in like education. Um, I, there's like, um, something called, um, Oh, what is it? Um, uh, like loan forgiveness <clears throat> where they'll, um, uh, allow you to, basically forgive your loans if you went to school and obtain you know loans while you were in college um they'll forgive your loans if you sign up to teach four years and it's like a, it's kind of a catch-22 because although it's good it's great but in a way it's like there's still some type of control in your life and um, you only get this if if i get this from you um so you know that's the one thing that kind of bothered me about that they got their freedom but not actually really getting the freedom they just went to kind of work um from pulling cotton or, you know, whatever kind of grain or agriculture to, you know, now for the men serving as um, soldiers, you know, risking their lives, sometimes giving their lives, and then also converting to yet again, another false religion. Um, and this, I'm not gonna read through all of this, but there's a couple of points in here that I wanna point out. Um, it said at the time uh, when this first came about, it was about 100 
people here, population about, population about 100 people in or, in or around the year 1727. Um, and then it spread up to South Carolina, what was going on. And that's pretty far because South Carolina is, um, you know, the state itself is pretty far away from Florida. Um, but it says here the city of Charleston, I think it is, or Charles, well, it's Charleston now, but Charles pronounced Charlestown back then which is now Charleston today. Um, it's only about, I would say, well, it says 200 miles from Florida. I was thinking about how far it was from Savannah. It's about, um, gosh, maybe two hours from Savannah. Um, but anyway, um, they were, the word began to spread all the way up there. And then more people from that area began to head down that way. And they said it's the, the attraction of Fort Moshe or Mose is believed to have helped inspire the Stono Rebellion in 1739. Um, now I've heard about the Stono Rebellion. Um, if you haven't um, heard of that yourself, I would suggest you looking into that. It's pretty interesting. It's almost like, um, it reminds me of the Haiti revolt. And they said this was led by free slaves or being by slaves who were fresh from Africa. Um, and then it said that these Africans were believed to be from the kingdom of Congo, which is interesting because I've, during my DNA test, I also had some traces of um, Congolese or Central Africa in my DNA. And I um, met some Congolese people here in um, the city that I live in. And they also said, you know, you look very Congolese. So I get that I look Congolese. I get that I look Trinidadian. I get that I look um, uh, South African. I mean, it's, it's just interesting. Um, but anyway, so these um, people were from the Congo and they were also baptized into Catholicism as well. Um, so I, I'm going to leave the link down below um, because I don't want to take up too much time. I want to show some other things too. But before I leave off of this, I want to talk about this paragraph here. It says, after East Florida was ceded to the British in the Peace of Paris, 1793, I mean, 1690, 1763, sorry, most of the free black inhabitants migrated to Cuba with the evacuating Spanish settlers. At that time, the population, the black population at St. Augustine and Fort Mose totaled about 3,000 of whom were about three quarters uh, escaped slaves. And then it says here that um, the road that, um, let me just start here, a haven for escaped slaves from the British colonies to the North Fort Mose is considered the premier site on the Florida Black Heritage Trail, the National Park Service highlights it as a precursor site of the Underground Railroad. This was also, this was the network in the antebellum years preceding the American Civil War, which why, by which slaves escaped to freedom, most often to the North and Canada, but they also went to the Bahamas and Mexico. I thought that was interesting. I had never heard of before, um, you know, free blacks, I mean, escape, slaves escaping uh, slavery by going to the Bahamas or Mexico. That was interesting for me to hear. So here's just some pictures of it here. Um, I think this is like an old time map of it. Um, it's now a historical park that you can go to. And so I'm actually thinking about planning a trip down there to go with my family and see it. I've been, um, no, I haven't been to St. Augustine actually. I've been other places around there, but I have not been to St. Augustine. I'm kind of driven through it, but I have not been to St. Augustine, Florida. Um, but I'm interested in going now and going to visit this. Now, this also made me think about something else. This here, Israel Hill. Um, now, some of you all may have heard of this before. Again, and some of you all may not have heard of this. This is a very interesting um, tale. Well, I don't say tale, but um, history, historical, historical piece as well. Okay, guys. So um, back to what I was saying here. This um, article that I was showing you guys um, earlier about Fort Mose reminded me of Israel Hill. And this is a location in Farmville, Virginia, where... Um, a group of free blacks um, were willed land from their slave owner. Um, and there's some history on it here that I wanna show you here. I'm not gonna read through all of this. I'll leave this description, I mean, this link in the description box as well. Um, if you wanna go back and read through it, but again, you can also um, just do a quick search on this because this is fa uh, fairly public knowledge as well. And um, it shouldn't be too hard to find as it wasn't hard for me to find, but I'll read through this. Um, it says here, Prince Edward County and, um, uh, Farmville, Virginia, um, there was a slave owner that was, um, his name was Richard Randolph. He was nephew to uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and he just immensely opposed the idea morally of having and owning humans as slaves. Um, however, his father had a bunch of debts that he had to um, pay back. And 
um, he had to still employ his, um, well, I say employ like loosely, um, but employ his slaves in order to um, acquire the income and the money to be able to take care of those debts. Um, anyway, so long story short, he had said that once he pays off all the debt, he will um, free the slaves or if he was to die, whichever came first, he would free the slaves. Um, and so he ended up dying at a very young age. He was 26 years old. And he had it already in his will that he would free and um, free the slaves that he owned and then give them a piece of land. So his um, wife went through with that, succeeded in that. Um, I'm not sure why it says about 10 years after his death, but nevertheless, um, 25 acres here was deeded over to these families and they were free. They chose to call their settlement, settlement Israel Hill because it was their promised land. Um, and I find that very interesting. Um, I don't think that these people just said that just simply because they read it in the Bible, talk about the promised land. Um, yeah, you have to remember nephew to Thomas Jefferson. This we're going back like 200 years or so, um, and it's very likely that mo many of these people may not have even even been able to read, especially with them being slaves um, or read English. I would say at, at least they weren't taught that. Um, so it wasn't this wasn't done closer to the end of, of so-called slavery or agricultural slavery the way we are familiar with it being at that time. Um, you know where you know people begin to. Um, you know, learn how to do these things and read and teach themselves how to read even in a, in a higher rate um, at, towards the end of, you know, slavery in the 18, late 1800s. Um, this was done years, multiple years before that. So I believe that it's very possible that these people may not have even been able to read. Um, now, it's also very likely that they may have been able to read or at least taught themselves how to read um, because with the acres that they won or they were, they received from, um, their former slave owner, they begin to set up things and shops and businesses on their land. Um, and it begins to become a community. Um, and I love that, you know, I, I, I love being able to, I love the idea of being able to live in a community of your people who are like-minded, like spirit, um, who are not about, you know, drama and, and crazy and conf craziness and conf confusion and foolishness. Um, you know, they're, they're just peaceful people living their lives. Now, when I say community, I'm not speaking in regards to, um, Sometimes people can get really, the communities to me can get really, 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 if you're not careful, they can become very um, dangerous. Whereas, um, you know, it, 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 you know, you kind of isolate, isolate yourself so much from the outside world from everybody else that you only become your own, um, I don't want to say God, but, um, you know, I, I just want to say, you, you know, you just have to be careful with that. So I'm not opposed to living amongst your people we are supposed to do that set apart people set apart nation um but however i am very cautious about that about you know different communities as sometimes things can, can get a little left if you're not careful um and people can begin to idolize different people or different ones in the community and you know, it can just kind of get off, 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 you know, kilter just a little bit. However, getting back on track to this, I want to say that, um, you know, they begin to set up their community here and it says here, this community develop a commercial following so that once they were finally freed, they already had a customer base well established. These businesses were blacksmithing, dairy, tobacco or tobacco farming, carpentry, a general store, um, typically the same businesses found in the white communities. Um, so I think this is interesting. You know, they begin to, at some point they begin to take away the, the weapons that they owned um, because they were afraid that um, they would use it against the white people, the white community, and that they will use it in an attempt to uh, free other slaves. Um, but, you know, shortly after that, they were able to get their um, weapons back. And it just kind of sounds a lot like what's going on today with all these gun control laws and, um, you know, all these shootings that's taking place around the country. Um uh, and how the government is working really hard in, in, um, alongside of these shootings that's taking place to force and establish rules uh, about gun control law. Now, I don't have guns. I don't own weapons, but I know a lot of people do, and I'm not opposed to you owning them um, or anyone owning them. But I just feel like, you know, it's just another way to, for, um, you know, martial law to be set up or you know when the mark of the beast and things of that nature actually get set in place um they can have your hands tied in, in a way and illegally be able to do so um so that su doesn't surprise me that they were doing that even way back then um and they are still doing it now um and i just want to show you guys that here it says guns were taken from free black community members for that for fear that they would be used to free the rest of the slaves um and that kind of came about um that fear kind of crept in after 
the Nat Turner Revolt. Now, if you guys haven't seen that movie, I would highly advise, you know, go watching that. That's a great movie. Excellent movie. Um, very, very, very interesting. I loved it. Um, another thing I thought about is that, I mean, another thing I want to point out here is that um, everyone that was in Israel Hill, they were free slaves. However, they were, had, still had family members who were freed. I mean, who were not freed. So um, because it says here, because the rest of the South continued to rely quite heavily on slavery, there were times when a free member of Israel Hill might have to buy his wife at an auction because she was still a slave or a father had to see his children sold off at auction because his wife was a slave and um, the children followed the status of the mother. So if the mother was free, that means the children were free. Since children typically tend to stay with the mother if the homes are broken that broken up in that regard um and then also if the mother was a slave and the children were considered slave property as well um but that's all i wanted to point out here um there's more information you can find about this um but i do want to highlight that both of these were communities uh fort mose um and then also Israel Hill. These both were communities established by free blacks. Um, and they, once they got their freedom, they worked to establish their own sorts of, um, you know, kind of economy. And, and it also reminds me of um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Black Wall Street. Um, and I think it's I think it's highly important that we as a people today we have to get back to this this the same fighting spirit that was in our ancestors back then it's still in us today even though we have a lot of oppression a lot of things on top of us that keeps it dormant we still have that and I think we have to work and fight as hard as we can to get back to that place um, you know whether you establish that community in America or if you feel led to move somewhere else I think wherever we are we have to work to become a nation again as long as we're divided then you know with, without any kind of order or control. Um, within ourselves, um, then, you know, we will continue to be demised and stepped upon, upon by everyone else. Um, and this is not an attempt to formalize a militia or anything like that. I'm just saying that we have to learn how to respect one another even more better than what we do. Even those of us in the truth, we all know that, you know, there's a lot of discrepancies within the truth. Um, you know, not organizing so that we can attack or, you know, cause problems, but um, organizing so that we can have something for ourselves as much as we possibly can. Um, and even if we do it separately, when you hear of someone else doing something like this, you know, support them. Um, a lot of times our people think they made it when they when they put on, you know, designer clothing like those top fi famous designers like Gucci and Balenciaga and, uh, you know, Zach Posen and Queen uh, Alexander McQueen or whatever. And I used to love those things back a few years ago. But now that I realize more about my history and I'm learning more about my history and where I come from, I'm not impressed by wearing um, those brands anymore. I do not believe that I've arrived when I put on the clothes of um, someone who more than likely does not like me or my people. Now, that's just me. I'm not saying these people are raising it like that, but I don't really know if they do a whole lot to better the community that we are amongst. I don't even think they, I would not, I would go as far as to say, I don't believe that they even consider it. Um, but again, like I said, we have to support each other. You know, there's a lot of uh, small businesses that are popping up now that I love. Like when I get my head wraps, I support small businesses. They are owned by African, so-called African people, um, Israelite people. Um, you know, different Hebrew garments that we may wear or buy if we're not making them ourselves. You know, support our Hebrew brothers and sisters, you know. Um, and that way we can help establish um, more of a sense of community within ourselves and how we treat and respect each other. Um, so I'm coming now to, to the end of my video. Um, but anyway, but I just wanted to put that out there that these were two, um, there's plenty more I know around the country, but these two um, definitely are ones that one I just learned of recently and or today, and then the other one that I, I heard about a year ago. But um, we have to focus and get back to this, you all. So I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you in the next video. Shalom.